Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Ramon. I work for a company called Interface. We make uh, carpet tiles. And I'd like to share some perspective on sustainability at, at three different levels. At the company, managing sustainability at the company, managing sustainability at the product, and managing sustainability at the system where your product coexists. And I think the, the wider the scope, the bigger the opportunities are. Let me tell you just a very few words about Interface. We are the biggest carpet tile manufacturer, um, around 30, 35% uh, market share. And we, uh, we came up with this idea of cutting the carpet into squares so that it could be easily installed, easily deinstalled. And uh, we became, this is company founded in 1972. We became a, a billion dollar uh, company by the 90s. And um, our founder got these questions from the, these green architects from California saying, what do you do for the environment? And they didn't have any answer. And these guys, you know, they were from the border between Alabama and Georgia. So you can more or less imagine the, 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 uh, the, what would be the response. We obey the law. So these guys got a book uh, from, this guy got a book from Paul Hawken, The Ecology of Commerce. And he understood that businesses were, you know, the culprits of the, the, the state where we are in the planet. But also, they were the only solution. It wouldn't be from the consumers. The drive wouldn't be from governments. The drive wouldn't be from other type of groups. It would be the drive of business and the innovation required. And he challenged the whole business to come up with something. And you know how the Americans are. Woo, yeah, let's go for zero. <laughs> Yeah, this is, how would a cynical Spaniard like me have, <laughs> <laughs> we, how would a guy in Brussels, yeah, would, would have, we would have said, what is technically feasible? 20%, let's go for 15. <laughs> this is how we set up targets in, in, in governments, in, in, in many companies, because we want to be sure. And this naivety, you know, the, 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 the Americans really, what, what, what did was to, to challenge people at an unprecedented level. So it's just reducing a little bit with the obvious things wasn't good enough. And, and it has driven a lot of innovation, product innovation, uh, because we were challenging every single raw material in the products, process innovation, we were challenging how we put together those products, because it is never enough. So sometimes by shocking people with a wider, bigger target, something things you know, can go faster. And, and actually, sometimes it's easier than just doing the, the, the usual stuff. These are some of the figures we have achieved. Interface as a company. By, we have reduced the carbon by 98%. This is pro progress we have done here in Europe. 95% renewable energy already. We're almost on 100% is going to be in the next six months. With a lot of energy efficiencies, obviously, uh, you cannot just only pay renewable energy because you know, it might be more expensive in, in some places. We reduce water intensity. We don't send any waste to landfill. And this, we are already on 54% of our raw materials to make carpet. I mean, nylon, the, the, the older, the latex, is already 54% of our raw materials recycled or bio-based. And by doing that, we have reduced our average embodied impact by around 50%. And the goal is to, to, to get that closer to 100 by 2020. So this is, this is not sci-fi. This is possible with today's technology, and it's possible just by just aiming a little bit higher. And it's possible by also being a profitable company. And we are not a niche. We are not a niche company doing the sustainability right thing. We are the major carpet tile manufacturer in the, in the world with around 50 million square meters. But I'd like to stop here because this is, it, it, it sounds like a very good story. Oh yeah, and you get you know, maybe a bit of reputation and, 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 and everybody's happy, but at the end of the day, I'd like to, to, to reflect that this is a little bit meaningless uh, in the wider scheme of things. Because we're talking about what we call corporate sustainability, is the impact of our factories. And the impacts of our factories are little compared to the impact of our products across the whole supply chain. Because around 80% of the impact of our product is in the suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers. Also, there is impact in maintaining 
the product, in recycling the product. And we need to move, what I argue is that we need to move from only thinking about what is the impact of our own company, of, of, about our own offices, to think about the wider impact, about the product that that company makes. So it's a shift from what we call the old paradigm of corporate sustainability, which at the end is a beauty contest, who gets uh, this award, who gets this PR, it's, it's a competition on marketing. Uh, and awards and certifications towards really redesigning the product that you sell so that it is much more environmentally sound. I'd like to focus now on this. Later, we'll talk about that later, about systems. But let's now focus on at product level. So this is what I'm challenging businesses, to shift from looking at your own company impacts to take also accountability for all the impacts of your product across the whole supply chain. So this is a, well, there is an analysis called life cycle assessment. There is a tool to measure what is the actual impact of a product across all the, its life cycle. For one kilogram of cement, one square meter of carpet, or you know, one square meter of, of ceiling, most of these physical things, the impact is not in the company's manufacturing. This is normally around 10% or less. The impact is in the raw materials, in making stuff, in transforming chemicals. And there's a huge supply chain out there using a lot of energy just to provide you with raw materials. And companies normally just put together, factories just assemble things. So the impact is there. So what's the point of uh, asking if, you, if, if this company has ISO 14001 certification and this and that, when what you're buying normally is a finished product? Of course, there is some use and maintenance as well in some products like carpet. Um, what is the, if imagine if you had a car or a vacuum cleaner or an air conditioning, what would be the profile? Where, is the big, what would, be, where would be the biggest impact? By far. It would be here. Is the petrol used to run a car? or to run a building. And we're getting better at, at managing the impacts of buildings. So that is becoming much more visible, embodied impacts of the raw materials. You can redesign a car by making the car with different raw materials, like aluminum. So light weighting is one way of reducing the impact of a car. This auto stop uh, technologies, start stop technologies, brake energy recovery. So you can redesign a car so that it is more energy efficient. You also can redesign a kilogram of cement or a carpet tile so that it is more embodied energy efficient. Both are a product design, uh, we'll talk about that later. Both are a product design solution um, issues and, and product design is absolutely key to redesign a product with different raw materials where we are talking about the building is the same when you're talking about a part of the building or a part of, or of or a physical product you can redesign that product with different raw materials and once you understand what is the impact for example of a carpet you also understand that 60 percent is on the yarn which actually is what makes carpet a carpet which is hard pill to swallow for a carpet manufacturer but once so LCA sometimes tells you what is this elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk. And when you are talking about this elephant in the room, you know that you are in the right sustainability strategy. <laughs> so we, we, every, every company has an elephant in the room. If you address that, then you are in the right thing. So in Interface, we had to look at it and we have to face the bull by its horns, as we say in Spanish, and we really had to think about making carpet with less yarn. So using less yarn, using carpet with recycled yarns, and finding alternative raw materials, not only on the yarn, but on other. And this is our sustainability strategy. This has been, in the, for the last 10 years, our main sustainability strategy. It's very easy to, to say once you face the issue, but it's quite uh, dramatic to change all the um, uh, raw materials. So we've done things like making carpet with 50% less yarn, so it's a very flat carpet. Uh, it, doesn't, it wouldn't work in some markets where they really like the luxury 
uh, uh, the luxurious look of the carpet, but it would work in the education market in the UK or in countries where we hate carpet, like in Spain or, or in Sweden, where do they like wooden floors. So we are entering those markets like education in the UK or Spain or Sweden with this new uh, very flat carpet with less environmental impact. And some, actually some of the end users have been also buying this type of carpet. But also recycling, using recycled nylon. And we pushed one of our suppliers to, to, to provide us with recycled nylon and, and we help them. We gather fishing nets, um, for example, in countries like Philippines, and we take those fishing nets and we recycle, we, can be, we recycle those fishing nets which are made of nylon six into new nylon and we buy that nylon from that supplier. And today we can offer around 500 colorways, more than 500 colorways in recycled nylon. If you look at those things, you can reduce dramatically. This is a carpet probably, not, not this one, but very like this one, wool, road loom, like a wall-to-wall -wall carpet, very old school, 63.3 kilograms of CO2 per square meter. This is a typical road loom, probably this one, around 22. This is a product that we had in 1996. This is the standard carpet tile today. This is a carpet tile which uh, half the amount of yarn and 100% recycled nylon. And these are uh, our latest innovations. Three, by, this is just by tweaking the product design. And you can do the same with every single physical thing in this room, including a kilogram of cement by changing raw materials. And the question is, what is the Kilograms of CO2 per whatever, kilogram of raw material or square meter or whatever you, however you measure. Product design is huge. And delivery, the biggest delivery is, is, is actually that. Now, let us reflect on what, what did the, the, the car industry, they, they have done a lot of innovation in the last 10 years. Why is that? Because the EU, said, what is the biggest issue? They understand that they understood that is the energy at use, and they develop a magic metric called grams of CO2 per kilometer. Then they did top-down goals so that every car manufacturer needs to, go at, needs to arrive at 2020 uh, with a figure of 95. If you don't arrive to that figure, you pay a fine. Then mandating this metric on the advertising for every car in Europe, you need to display that metric. So you create literacy on the market. My mom knows that 99 grams of CO2 is quite all right, and 170 is a lot, because we have created that literacy. You don't need any bloody certification or labels to tell you whether a product is more or less environmentally sound. It is regulated, and it is measured. And it is so key that some of the car manufacturers have been cheating it. <laughs> Because you have changed the whole industry. And then you, you allow member states, like in the UK, if you have a company car with more CO2, you pay more tax. In France, if you have a, uh, a, a car with more CO2, you, have, you pay more tax. Road tax, you pay more for more CO2. Seat incentives in Salford, you can park uh, free cars of less than X percent. So all of these things, you allow, this magic metric allow legislators to to radically change markets because you create demand. Now think what we could do with the, in the building sector. We could do the same. We could look at energy at use, kilowatts hour uh, of heating, for example, and, and operating the building. Then you can mm, say embodied energy as well. Then you can have the mandatory display where we're getting there, actually, in mandatory display of energy certificates, European-wide goals that we could get there. And also we could do tax. How if stamp duty was based on energy efficiency? Maybe that would encourage people to do the energy renovations, the, the renovations before selling, for example. So we need to apply that thinking that happened in the, in the car industry, in the building industry, if we really want to, 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 um, to get those uh, to, to advance. And I'll stop here for the product. So this is about uh, the view on, on, on the product. We talk about company and we talk about product. And then the other thing I'd like to touch is on the system because I think this is even more interesting. When you talk about the LCA of a car, you can redesign a car so that it, ha it spends less energy, it is more sustainable. 
But at the end of the day, also, you need to look at the system and, and, and ask, what is the LCA of the city of London? And maybe you don't need cars. Maybe you have other type of solutions. So it's about doing the scope at ecosystem level. For a car, it could be a city or it could be a country. For a raw material, actually, it could be a building, but could be a city as well. And thinking, how can I apply my core competencies to disrupt the system so I can get more market share, I can expand to adjacent markets based on what I really know about my core competence. I'll give you a very stupid example. This is what we do in, in interface. We came up with an idea to substitute the glue. This is a sticker that you put on the corner of four tiles so that all the tiles, they, 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 um, they are fixed to each other, but they don't stuck to the subfloor. So you don't damage the subfloor. You literally take out all the VOCs. Um, and it has a lot of strength in this direction, but no strength on this direction. So you can substitute one tile for the other, um, but this, the floor doesn't move. We basically, what we're doing is jumping on an adjacent market to steal the market share of the glue with this. And the same process, the same salesperson who sells the carpet also can sell this. So this is what I mean. It's about thinking, it's about allowing companies to think, what can I, how can I disrupt the system? How can I make more sustainable the system, looking at my core competencies, and expand to an adjacent market? Which is what is happening here, for example. You know, these guys cannibalizing the gas. So they are asking the EU to renovate 3% of the, the, the buildings in order to generate market for them, B doing a great job of disrupting the uh, utilities. The electrification of cars versus fuel. So there is a lot of wars. And these inter-sector wars are very interesting because these are what really creates new sustainable systems at that level. So smart, te smart technologies in building, replacing a lot of different things. And it's about my core capabilities. It's the core capabilities of the ancillary industry in the North Sea, applying those core capabilities to, from the old industry to a new industry. It's the same people doing it, the same ancillary companies doing it. But on a new, different system. So they're expanding from one thing to another one, based on your core competence. And these are the questions. Sorry. Well, let's go to, to this one. What are we cannibalizing there? This is a typical office. This is BBC. Where, what do you think a bloody carpet tile is cannibalizing in that office? What do you don't see there? Any thoughts? Chairs, furniture. Chairs, furniture. There is a lot of furniture there, yeah? Lots of colors. Lots of colors. It's the walls. What we're doing is saying to our friends, the architects, why don't you design spaces who are flexible? Because we know marketing is going to report to sales and the other way around. We're going to have a reorganization every five months. And we need to create flexible spaces. We know the canteen is going to become something else and then we cannot really disrupt the business by doing that. Let's create flexible spaces. Why don't you use carpet at the center using its modularity, its flexibility, the colors we can change? And we don't do that on our own. It's the carpet and this new mm, way of making furniture. And, and it's these other actors who, you know, that come in with us and we create a new way of doing flexible spaces. So we can ableize the wall and the paint that goes to the wall and all these fixed items that go to the wall. And also we can extract a value because we provide value. So we have put concept designers in our key markets to help architects redesigning and making the most use. So even with something as simple and let's say in a way in, 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 in a, as a stupid as a carpet tile, you can be very, very radical. So I would urge you to think 
within your scope of influence, where are your core competencies and where can you, where in the system can you use your core competencies to disrupt old and sustainable practices and also make more business. And I think for me this is uh, the, the, the best scope when you think on that. I think we need to think on the three, your company, how to make your product better, but also we need to think on that. And many sustainability professionals still, we are not you know, playing on, on that, on that uh, scope, which I think is more interesting. Some questions? Some thoughts? Some challenges? How are we doing in terms of time? 10 minutes? Shall we take a couple of questions now and we move to something else? Yeah, we'll, we'll show you some slides later. Any other thoughts on this paradigm and how it might affect your product or your scope of work? I like, I like the idea of how you put carpet tiles to kind of make it clear for different areas in the office. I think not to kind of go against it, but I think in the type of business, and kind of the, the, the quiet areas that we need in an office, our type of business as a wealth management would struggle having a completely open plan office. That's just my opinion. And yeah, and I think not having closed rooms, we need that in the type of industry we're in. Absolutely, and also it's but so it's about how can you make how can you also can design these closed offices in a, in a modular way mm -hmm. so that if if you need to redesign then you don't create disruption in the office. And there are ways, I'm sure there are now manufacturers and, and designers who can do that in the least disruptive way. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what you were asking about the circular economy and provide some thoughts because this is a big subject of sustainability, the circular economy, and, and, and it touches on many, in many, on, on many aspects. First, we are very lucky as a business because modularity is absolutely key for the circular economy. We install a tile, we, you know, we provide services of the installation or installation. We have our own team, so this is a guy taking carpet back for us to recycle. Imagine taking this clunky broad loom, which is not modular. It would be a, logistically, it would be a nightmare. So modularity is key. If you want to be modular, if you want to be circular, you need to have your product in a modular way. And we need to design buildings and spaces in a modular way, where elements can be taken, can be replaced. And that flexibility is absolutely key for the circular economy. I've been struggling for many years on recycling and, and, and I've learned, uh, you know, we've had some successes but also we had some issues because it's, it is very difficult. And these are some of the thoughts in terms of, you know, what is, what is the, the economics of recycling. First of all, if a country doesn't ban landfill or keeps the landfill fees very low, it's impossible to fight against that. So landfill cost or waste to energy capacity, legislation, the market is key. Whether you can extract a service fee from the customer or not is key. Transport costs, what are the sorting costs? Because there are some, for example, for us it's a carpet we can go to reuse, uh, can go to waste to energy or can go for recycling. So we have some sorting costs and technology related to those sorting costs, labor costs, separation uh, cost of you know, the, the nylon and the different materials and this depends on technology, the maturity of the technology and also the labor costs. And then the raw material revenue which you can make. If you don't get every single thing right, there is no a recycling model. The more complicated the raw material is, the more difficult to recycle. So for a ceiling it's quite easy. It's less complicated than for example for a carpet tile because it has less different layers of raw material. So this is what we're doing. Um, actually, I'm about to set up a hub, which is already working in, in Milton Keynes, where we take carpet, tiles, and they get sorted 
and they can go this they, we employ people with social issues like long term unemployed etc and then these people would sort out the tiles for recycling which goes to our machine in the Netherlands and we can recycle we can recover the backing and the fluff the nylon fluff for recycling or we can reuse some of the carpet so some of the carpet is quite good uh, still and so we are looking at markets for, for, for that. It can, it can be charity, but it can be something else. It can be temporary flooring, etc. So we are setting up now a, a recycling center in the UK, um, in France. We have in Holland for, for a while. And this is also in the circular economy. Some people tell me about leasing. And they said, oh, well, you lease carpet. Well, we tried to lease carpet. But it is not interesting for our customers, for for the reason that when you lease something, you want the whole functional unit. You don't. You lease a car with all the services, etc. You don't want to lease the wheel of a car. And carpet is actually the wheel for a building. So why would you like to just lease the the wheel? You you, you need to. You, there are people already making lots of money renting out and leasing office space, <laughs> cannibalizing us, of course, and the other manufacturers because they're they're very good at purchasing. So. You need to play on that game. But that doesn't mean that interface, we cannot make also money not only from selling the product, but selling the functionalities of the product, the beauty, the performance of the product. This is one of the things we're looking at. Concept design, we have increased our concept design capabilities. So we have now uh, designers actually working full time for interface, working with the, our, our customers, designers and architects doing floor plans, designing, doing specials. For example, that is a way of increasing our value. We do project management. For example, in Holland, we have done some of project management for, for, for big projects. We can do audit where, or whether the, you know, to, to, to see whether the carpet is still maintained correct or not. We do the fitting service. Uh, we do maintenance, uh, like a coming every six months or every year with, with a, with a uh, proper cleaning, deep cleaning. It's the installation services and take back. So it's about us, instead of just listening, thinking about additional services. And also we're looking at, the circular economy is also about looking at different raw materials. Scavenging out waste. So we're taking, this is a, a PVB, which is a layer that goes in laminated uh, glass from buildings or from car windscreens. And, and it's a waste from the glass recycling industry. We're taking that PVB and we substitute our latex in carpet, for example. So we make them from recycled sources. But as mentioned before, recovering fishing nets, which are abandoned in beaches in the Philippines or in Africa, and recycling that nylon. So it's about this idea of recycling, of scavenging out waste. Is that response to your question or, yeah? yeah? Any other thoughts? I, uh, I, I, my company puts down an awful lot of carpet tiles each year. And they always seem to come in boxes of 10. <laughs> Wide boxes of 10 and maybe Interface does 100 and they're not a box or something. But there just seems to be a huge packaging issue there that needs to be dealt with. And, and I don't know what happens to that packaging afterwards because the installer takes it away. I hope they recycle it, but I don't know for sure. Do Interface do anything with packaging? Yeah, well, depends on how tall is the tile, yeah. uh, how, how you know, big is the pile, like more or less the boxes are. This, this, uh, this, yeah, no, well, they're like this, it uh, depends on, and um, we have reduced the, the, the cardboard a lot, which are only like two layers instead of three layers, but what is the right size for the installers? That's a question, yeah, but that's a, you know, we thought that that was the right size, but maybe it's something we need to look at, and uh, whether we can offer a service we look in, in, in to look at a service where we can take back the boxes but you know cardboard is already so widespread recycling that is not value for us to, to take them back when there when you know the, there is a local cardboard <coughs> recycling but in, in terms of what is the actual the, the the optimum size it will depend also on maybe you have big projects and maybe you think you know but some other uh, smaller projects yeah. Oh, I have a mix of both, 12, 12 square meter offices or 1,000 square meters. It would be great if I could go and get 1,000 square meters worth of tiles on, on pallets and for the small office, a couple of boxes. What do you mean? A pallet without the, without the, the cardboard? I think we can arrange that. Um, 
it, it, there are issues, our technical people, they, they have issues with the damaging because it depends on how it's transported, etc. But um, and it depends which type of products. There are some products that, that can be more damaged than others, which are more maybe stiff. Any other thoughts? Thank you. Thank you very much.